Okay, people, here we are. We're in the book Hebrew, James and Jude by R.J. Rush Dooney. And we're in chapter 4 of James, so let's go. Four, pure religion and undefiled, James one, nineteen to twenty seven. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself. Behold him. I just noticed that this, this, this was not straight. Can't have that. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. For whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1, 19-27 In James 1, 19-27, we are plainly told, first, that our Christian faith does not make us into judges over other men, but enables us to grow, to improve ourselves he thus begins in verse 19 following, quote, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. End quote. Men are quick to spot the evils of others, but not their own. James Moffat said of verses 19 and 20, quote, when James, like Peter, hastens to urge the moral and spiritual activities of Christians, he passes from the idea of the regenerating word to the conception of the word as seed which has to be cared for. If it is to thrive, indeed, he develops the metaphor more definitely. When James... When James, like Peter, hastens to urge the moral and spiritual activities of Christians, he passes from the idea of the regenerating word to the conception of the word as seed which has to be cared for if it is to thrive. Indeed, he develops the metaphor more definitively. Definitely, I was going to say definitively. What is this? Fresh nonsense here. There we go. <clears throat> Indeed, he develops the metaphor more definitely than Peter, given the divine seed. Give. Give the divine seed a clean soil. End quote. The condition whereby the word of God is properly received is humility. The word must be received with humility, with meekness, verse 21. James does not flatter his readers. He summons them to, quote, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls, verse 21. Lenski's translation reads, quote, Wherefore, by putting away all shabbiness and what there is a lot of baseness and what there is therefore by putting away all shabbiness and what there is of a lot of baseness 
go get it. Wherefore, by putting away all shabbiness and what there is of a lot of baseness, accept with meekness the implanted word that is able to save your souls. End quote. Second in verses... Tw I'm going to have to adjust the... Um, the... Uh, what do we call it? The compressor here, folks. Um, it's just not kicking in as it should do. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, a threshold. Let's change the threshold here. Drive density. Two, 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 two. No, it's not right. No, no. Where's the threshold? Frequency. Threshold. De Enhancer. Expander. Git. Ah, so uh, I don't quite understand what's happening here. Drive, density, line, where on earth is the... Second, in verses 22 to 25, James tells us... Okay, that's better, but um, it's not quite the same profile. Okay, I'm going to roll with that and do the best. James tells the readers how humility is to be used. It is not something that is limited to an attitude, but is rather active obedience. The believers are to be doers of the word, not hearers only, for to be hearers only is to deceive or cheat one own self, one own self. Hey, one, I'm a one-known self kind of guy. He's too close, man. The believers are to be doers of the words, not hearers only. For to be hearers only is to deceive or cheat one's own self. Then, in verses 23 to 25, James gives us an unusual illustration, a mirror. Those who are hearers only and not doers of the word of God are like a man who looks into a mirror to see if he's pleased with himself. Having done this and having satisfied himself that his hair is properly combed, his clothing in place and his general appearance pleasing, he moves on. He is not mindful of, quote, what manner of man he is, end quote, However, the man who makes God's law, his mirror, tries to conform himself to the image God requires of him. God's law is the... God's law is, quote, the perfect law of liberty, verse 25, and it impels man to be, quote, a doer of the word, end quote, such a man is blessed in his deed or doing. James thus insists that our true spiritual mirror is the law word of God. To neglect this mirror is to reject seeing ourselves as God sees us. If we use God's law as our mirror, we shall be blessed in what we do. Verse 25. This blessing has reference to time present. Here and now God blesses those whose mirror is his law, because they are doers of the law. The doers. Because they are the doers of his law. Third, in verses 26 and 27, we see the conclusion of this matter. The result of humility and obedience to God's law is a morality that is God-shaped, a morality that leads to social and personal righteousness or justice. The man whose mirror is only glass is wrapped up in himself. The man whose mirror is society may manifest social concerns, but their basis will be humanistic rather than godly. James insists on the law of God as our only true mirror because it alone sets forth the righteousness or justice of God. True religion, James says, easily manifests itself in our speech. It is not sound religion to be unbridled, 
are uncontrolled in our speech, verse 26. In chapter 3, James has more to say about speech, about the tongue. It is a barometer of our faith. It tells others how seriously or how lightly we take our faith. James is very much concerned about the use of intemperate or harsh language, and he sees it as an important test of the reality and seriousness of our faith. If anyone seems to be religious or appears to be a devout Christian but does not bridle his tongue, that person deceives his or her own heart and his or her, quote, religion is vain. Quote, religion is vain, verse 26. See that? I hadn't caught that. See that? If I hadn't caught that, the threshold is set. See that? It's better. Okay. This is blunt language and is intended to be taken very seriously. James says plainly that much piety on the surface is belied by an unbridled tongue and he thereby requires a self-examination that begins with our speech. James then proceeds to define in verse 27, quote, pure religion and undefiled, end quote. He has already cited intemperate language as the enemy of, quote, pure religion and undefiled, end quote. Now he gives us the positive side of his definition. It is, quote, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Verse 27. In Acts 6, 1-7, we learned that the early church in Jerusalem had many widows as members. James, as a resident there, was very familiar with their needs. Acts 6 tells us that these widows were fed, but James goes beyond that to ask or require that they be visited. The care of widows and orphans is basic to God's law, and God himself uses it first as a test of man. James's concern reveals how thoroughly he is a man of the law, a man for whom God's law is his mirror. The law of God is, quote, the perfect law of liberty, verse 25 to 12. Freedom is under God, not man. James summons us as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1-1, to live a life of freedom in him. It is Christ who sets us free. It is Christ who set us free from sin and death, John 4, 34-36, and his law is the perfect law of liberty. The goal of the Christian is, quote, to keep himself unspotted from the world, verse 27. This means to continue morally unblemished, not necessarily perfect, but always growing in the right direction. Sorry if that was a bit sing-songy, but... Uh No, let's hit the record button this time. I'm just going to drop that uh, down at one, two. Yeah, that's a little bit better now. Five, respective persons. James 2, 1 to 13. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons, for if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in your judge? Blah, 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 blah. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? 
If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love the labor. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well, but if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. James 2, 1 13. James speaks again of, quote, our Lord Jesus Christ, end quote, and he refers to him as, quote, the Lord of glory, verse 1. In verse 5, as in verse 12, he refers to Christians as those who love God. His purpose is to encourage... What, why did it start there? His purpose is to encourage them in their love and service. To call Jesus, quote, the Lord of glory, end quote, is to declare him to be the manifested presence of God among his people, First Samuel 4.22. Isaiah 6.3, John 1.14 To believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord of glory is not consistent, quote, with respect of persons, verse 1. Such a partiality to persons because of their status, whether rich or poor, is forbidden by God. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 1.17 in this instance, what is involved is favoritism to the rich. The Christian quote-unquote assembly is, in the Greek text, the synagogue. This was the earliest name for the church, the Christian synagogue, because it held strictly to the Old Testament revelation, saw itself not as a new group, but as the true vessel of the ancient faith. It attracted, especially in its earliest days, more than a few persons of note who were curious about this messianic synagogue when such persons attended the Christian synagogue, much attention was paid to them. Late comers sat on the floor, but these important, curious persons were given good seats rather than the floor space, verses 2-4. to four. This could be called courtesy, but at the same time, poor visitors had no such courtesy. 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 Poor visitors had no such courtesy extended to them. They were told to sit on the floor. Such partiality James calls evil, verse 4. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 1, one following, makes a like point, condemning partiality on the basis of status. The fact was that, while many prominent Greek and Roman converts were early made, for some years the notable Jewish thinkers stayed outside the Christian fold, no matter how great their curiosity. God, James reminded the church, was confounding the wisdom of the wise and choosing, quote, the poor of this world, end quote, as, quote, heirs of the kingdom, end quote, a kingdom, quote, promised to them that love him, verse 5. To show partiality to the cultured despisers of Jesus Christ is to go against the Lord. Already these powerful leaders were oppressing and arresting Christians and having them taken to court for trial, verse 6. Their treatment in court would not be lightened by their courtesy in church, for these leaders were heartless men. Quote, Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? Verse 7. In other words, their presence at the church was at times intended only to silence the Christians and to facilitate their arrest. James did not call for discourtesy to these visitors. Rather, he insisted on the same godly treatment of all in terms of the royal law. Quote, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Verse 8, Leviticus 19, 18, Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39, Romans 13, 8 and 9, Galatians 5, 14, 6, 2. 
James then makes an important point with respect to the law. It's a unity, not a collection of miscellaneous texts. To break a regulation of the states with respect to some rule about the disposal of trash does not make us guilty of law... does not make us guilty or lawless men in reality. There are enough status regulations enacted of which we are ignorant to convict us all many times over. God's law is different. It's a unity, and its purpose is justice. If we violate the law at any point, we have chosen injustice. We have broken the law. If we exercise daily and then take poison... The poison negates our exercise. So, James says, we must keep the whole law to avoid being a transgressor of the law. Verses 9 to 11. God's law is, quote, the law of liberty. Verse 12. But sin is slavery. John 8, 34. To break God's moral law at any point is to move from freedom into slavery. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Statist criminal law is having trouble disengaging itself from this biblical premise. However exemplary a man's life may be otherwise, if he commits murder... He is sentenced for murder. However, social factors are increasingly being weighed before sentence is pronounced. Instead of being governed by social factors and the status of men, we must be governed by God's law. Quote, the law of liberty, verse 12. James's conclusion is important. Quote, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Verse 13. We are not to be hard-hearted. The fact that the prosperous visitors to the meeting may be enemies of Christ does not give us the right to be merciless or unkind. The golden rule still must govern us. To show grace and mercy towards enemies will bring mercy and grace to us from our God. From our God. Magalachubalip. To show grace and mercy toward enemies will bring mercy and grace to us from our God. A.T. Robertson pointed out that, as late as the 4th century, there are references to the church as the, quote, synagogue, end quote. The reference to gold rings is better translated as, quote, a gold-ringed man, end quote, that is, having many rings. One of these would be the signet ring. Greeks and Romans wore many rings, often more than one on a finger, but never on the right hand. After the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal sent as a trophy to Carthage three bushels of gold rings taken from the Roman dead. Early Christians for some generations wore rings adorned with symbols of the faith such as the cross, the anchor, the monogram of Christ, etc., St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 echoes James and respected persons and calls attention to the false starting points of Jewish and Greco-Roman thought. Jesus Christ is the only true premise of thinking and those who reject him are, despite their claims of wisdom, fools and sinners. All right, let's continue continuing. Six. Hang on, what is this? Stereo? You joking? No. I say, no, no, no. Six. Faith and works. James 2, 14 to 26. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and yet have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, 
if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe, and tremble. But wilt thou, O man, O vain? But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Sayest thou how faith wrought with... wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled with Seth, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed upon him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out of another beloved? when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James 2, 14-26 This may well be the most controversial text in all the Bible. Many avoid James's epistle because they will not face up to this text. We need to recognize that much can be separated in analysis that cannot be separated in life. We can, and of necessity, do analyze the human respiratory system and the circulatory system separately, but neither can exist without the other. Faith in theology is tied to the doctrine of salvation and works to sanctification, but just as breathing is necessary for the life to the... the, 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 the Hang on. Just as breathing is necessary for the life of the heart, so too are works to a living faith. This is why James can say, quote, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Verse 24. Those who would separate faith and works can only do so theologically, and they should do so, but in life the two are inseparable. To take a theological distinction and assume that in life what is an otherwise valid and necessary difference is a radical separation of one from the other is to confuse dissection with life. James confronts us with this fact, quote, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith... I just remembered that I didn't turn the, haven't turned the uh, air on. Ugh. What a waste, eh? Can faith save him? Verse 14. Can a man live with a heart only and not lungs? James then uses a very practical illustration of the interconnection of faith and works. Given the need for charity in the Jerusalem Christian synagogue and like churches elsewhere, his example is both blunt and real. If a fellow believer is naked and hungry and we simply say, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, or we will pray for you and nothing more, what good is all this? Such a professed faith, having no works, is dead. It is dead because faith cannot stand alone. It manifests itself in works. Verses 15 to 17. James is not anti-theology. What he is against is the separation of theology from life, the reduction of faith to easy believism, and the negation of action as the expression of faith. Neither valid faith nor valid works can be separated one from another. 
Neither valid faith nor valid works can be separated one from another. How can any man demonstrate a valid faith without works? Faith is shown by works. Verse 18. Simple belief saves no man. Quote, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Verse 19. A more blunt and telling statement of the case cannot be imagined. Those in hell beginning with the very devils believe that God is. The knowledge makes them tremble, but it does not save them. Quote, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 20. Such a man is called vain by James. The word is kenos, meaning empty, foolish, senseless, purposeless. It is highly uncomplimentary. James does not dignify the position as one of valid descent. It is a fool's opinion. Then in verses 21 to 24, James turns to Abraham, the covenant father, revered alike by Jews and Christians. He says, without qualification, that Abraham was, quote, justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, verse 21. The reality of Abraham's faith was manifested in his readiness to obey God, even to binding Isaac to the altar, James 22, 9. God waited until Abraham's faith was shown by his works before he delivered Isaac. James continues, quote, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? Verse 22. Literally, James says, quote, Faith worked with his works. End quote. Faith became works, a realization of itself. Faith expressed itself or revealed itself in works. There is an essential connection between the two. This, James says, is what the scripture means when it says, quote, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 23. It is in Second Chronicles 27 that Abraham is called God's, quote, friend forever, end quote. In Genesis 15, 6, we are told that Abraham, quote, Believed in the Lord, and he counted... To, to, sorry, I adjusted my back and lost all consciousness of who I was. Believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. End quote. Paul cites this verse in Romans 4, 3 and Galatians 3, 6. Paul uses the text to criticise the idea of salvation through works. James, to call attention to the emptiness of faith without works... It was Paul who in Romans 3.31 said, quote, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, we establish the law. End quote. Above all, our Lord in Matthew 7.16-23 makes totally clear that, quote, Ye shall know them by their fruits, End quote, that is, by their works. It is plain James insists that a man is justified by his works, not by faith only. Verse 24. Works manifest the reality of a man's faith so that his justification is shown to be real by his works, not by his not by his faith only. James then gives another illustration, Rahab. The account in Joshua makes obvious the terror of the people of Jericho. They knew what God had done to other peoples so that they believed that the Hebrews' God was working to destroy their enemies. Only Rahab acted on that faith. Her works alone showed the reality of her faith. Hence, James says, she was justified by her works. That is, her justification was manifested in her works. Very clear in all that James has to say is that both faith and works of reference to God and his law. The Council of Trent related faith to assent to the church, and too many Protestant groups have in practice tended to do the same. Ugh, 
palacho, palachi. Tended to do the same. Both faith and works must be seen as essentially a trust in and obedience to God and his inscriptured word. James concludes with another blunt statement, quote, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Verse 26. James does not say it is weak, but rather that it is dead. Here again, as in the Sermon on the Mount and all the Gospels and Epistles, we are told how to, quote, judge righteous judgment, John 7.24. There are many who follow the... In- There are many who follow ancient Greek thinking to say that we cannot know a man's heart and therefore cannot judge him, whereas our Lord says plainly, By their fruits ye shall know them, Matthew 7.20. Works are faith in action, faith made manifest. All right, we're going to leave it there, and um, I'm going to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with you, Thank uh, with me. Uh, thanks for your encouragement. Uh, thank you for the likes and shares. If you're going to support this, keep on liking, sharing, uh, commenting, um, sending me a message, blah, blah, blah. It helps a lot. If you want to support the, the, the work to ha- uh, help me do more better work, you can do so by going to nathanteacher.com and making a little donation. That would be very helpful. And any questions you might have, just hit me up on the fake book or gab or whatever else is happening at the time okay cheerio and see you soon